We have the best culture. In our culture, there is no place for a woman. The brutal gang rape of a 23-year-old girl on her way home from a movie triggered an awakening that took many by surprise. The first two who've been arrested produced in court this afternoon. The girl is now on a ventilator, battling for life. Apart from Ram Singh and his brother Mukesh, who was driving the bus, four other men have been detained. The juvenile accused among the six arrested for the gang rape and torture. According to the latest government figures, one woman is now raped in India every 20 minutes. सोती थी तो आंख खींचती थी तब कहती मम्मी मम्मी ताली कभी एक हाथ से नहीं बजती दोनों हाथों से बजती है हर कोई शरीफ लड़की होती है रात को नौ बजे मतलब नहीं मोहम्मदी बीस मिनट गाड़ी चली है, मैंने चलाई थी। लाइटें बंद कर दी थी उन्होंने। भाई था मैं। जिस लड़के को मारा था, जाके वो सीटों के बीच में छुप गया। इस लड़की चिल्ला रही है, बचाओ, बचाओ। भाई की आ रही थी, गाड़ी मत रोक, चलाता रहिए। भाई को फिर मार्केट के पीछे लेके आधा आ जा रहे थे, बारी-बारी से जुनाइल और राम सिंह। बाकी बाद में अक्षय वगैरह ये सब गए थे। जुनाइल ने कपड़ा निकाल चुके थे उसने हाथ डाला। कुछ ऐसी चीज थी अंदर से लंबी लंबी सी निकली थी। अतड़िया ही थी कुछ। The lady on the other hand, we can say the girl or woman are more precious than a gem, than a diamond. It is up to you how you want to keep that diamond in your hand. If you put your diamond on the street, certainly the dog will take it out. You can't stop. <laughs> बुढ़ा पागा सारा बनिया था हमने मजूरियां कर कर के उन्हें बड़ा कर दिया हमारे बुढ़ा पागे लाठी थी सब संसार यही अपना बुढ़ा पागे लिए करते नहीं और तो कुछ दिया नहीं उठा के खंडा पे जला देगा उसको हमने देख के जलाते आखिरी बार जब हम उसको हॉस्पिटल में मिले उसने हाथ में हमारा हाथ लेके चुमा और बोला कि शोरी मम्मी हमने आपको बहुत तकलीफ दिया आई एम शोर जो आवाज आ रही थी सांस लेने के तो लिए तो वो बंद होने लगे ऐसे टेढ़े टेढ़े जो चलते हैं वो सीधा होने लगा
I'm going to put that right there because I have within me a lethal combination of garrulousness and such extreme passion for this subject that I could easily go on for a week. When I was 13, my father, who was an observant religious Jew, sent me to a religious school and in this segregated girls in one section of the school and boys in another, in a lesson of religious instruction, I discovered at the age of 13 that there is a prayer called the Shacharit, which means the dawn prayer, that men say every day, and in it, they say the words, I thank God that he did not make me a woman. At the first break, I went in search of Rabbi Tanza, the religious head of the school. And I confronted him with this and I said, Rabbi, I have just discovered today that this is a prayer that men say every day, and they say, I thank God that he did not make me a woman. Rabbi Tanza was somewhat nonplussed, didn't quite know how to react. And I leapt upon his paws and said, so Rabbi Tanza, you can take your Jewish Torah and stuff it up your ass. Rabbi Tanza phoned my father with alacrity and I was immediately expelled from the school. Now the Jewish religion is far from alone in this. I think the reason I wanted to start speaking to you tonight um, with those details is because I increasingly understand that the anger that I felt at that absolutely unjust expression about my gender, about women, as well as the injustice of my unfair dismissal from the school, has fueled, probably, most of my choices and my actions. Um, I grew up irreligious, <laughs> unsurprisingly. I grew up to be a filmmaker. My religion is people. I make films because I love people. Film to me is sacred. It is a powerful tool that can change the world. And I believe this with all my heart. I'm no stranger to campaigning films and I'm no stranger to having experienced at first hand how films can substantially move us on. I don't subscribe or hanker after a life hereafter. I have my feet firmly planted in this life and I believe my only purpose on earth is to leave this world a better place, to pass the baton on. I made my very first film as a producer, a film called Who Bombed Birmingham, about a case of a gross miscarriage of justice in Britain, the Birmingham Six case. And that film led directly to another appeal in the case and to the release of six innocent men who had spent 17 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit. That film had Margaret Thatcher stand up in the House of Commons the morning after its broadcast, apoplectic with rage, shouting, we will not have trial by television in this country. And that's exactly what we had and thank heavens for that. In December 2012, 
television screens across the world erupted with this news of yet another horrifying gang rape in Delhi. And my stomach somersaulted collectively with everyone around the world at the hideous details um, of this heinous crime. But it wasn't the rape that made the penny drop for me. It was the reaction to the rape. It was seeing unprecedented and extraordinary numbers of ordinary men and women of India out on the streets in a freezing Delhi December. Day after day, and from the 23rd of December on, after they had been in the, on the streets uh, already for several days, facing a ferocious government crackdown of water cannons and tear gas shells, Lati charges, those batons the police use. And I was in awe of their courage. And it occurred to me that I had never seen any other country in my lifetime stand up with such tenacity, with such passion and commitment as civil society, demanding an end to the brutal violations of women's rights, violations of human rights. And I thought, I've got to get on a plane immediately and lend my energies to amplifying this voice and make it be heard through film. So I gathered my family around me in the living room and my daughter was just 13 then. I said, Maya, you are my priority. If you say I cannot go, I will not go. And before she could answer, I very quickly said, but you need to understand that if I don't go, I'll never be able to look myself in the mirror again. And of course, the blackmail worked. <laughs> and she said, of course you must go. And off I went for two years, a journey really into the heart of darkness. I knew that in order to make a meaningful film, in order to get meaningful answers to the question that I set out with, which was, why? Why do men rape? Why does violent rape happen with such relentless regularity the world over? I knew I had to get the answers from the rapists themselves. I wrote an impassioned letter to the Director General of Tihar Jail in Delhi, where these, the most infamous prisoners in India, were incarcerated. And people continuously ask me in interviews, how on earth did you get permission to go into Tihar Jail, the most secure prison in India? The answer is, I asked. I asked. I spent a week writing a letter. It was so important for me that she should say yes. I think the fact that she was a she may have helped a great deal, certainly meant that she understood um, my plea as to how important it was that if we hope to change these men and their actions, we need really to understand them. And armed with my 150 odd questions, I went and interviewed seven rapists over 31 hours, over seven days. I think it's the most um, disturbing, deeply, deeply upsetting journey I've ever been on. There was a moment where I was really going to come home. I just thought I'd been insane to even start this. I felt my soul had been dipped in tar. There were no cleaning agents in the world that would ever get rid of this. I was going to crash. Um, and I woke up one morning at 5.30 in a de my little Delhi CD hotel room. Um, and I phoned home thinking, it's half past 12 in Copenhagen, where I was living at the time. My husband will answer, and I will make him book me a plane, because I woke up in a complete wet sweat. Uh, my heart was knocking against my rib cage. My teeth were chattering. It was a panic attack. 
And I couldn't even consider that I would be well enough to book a flight home. I just knew I had to leave, I had to go home. And so I phoned home and my little girl Maya, who was then 13 and a half, because I'd been gone for six months at this point, answered the phone and immediately said, Mommy, what's wrong? So I tried to lighten my voice. I put all my effort into saying, Maya, it's fine, nothing's wrong, I'm okay. I just need to speak to Daddy, it's really urgent. She said, what's wrong? She talked me down out of this panic attack. She made me get a pen and paper. I didn't have one, I pretended I had got one. And she made me write down, as I pretended to do, my problems and then instructed me to solve the small ones first, one by one. And then she said something I will never forget as long as I live. She said, Mummy, you cannot come home because I and my generation of girls are relying on you. So I stayed, and I'm really glad I did, because despite the fact that it's been a slalom ride, the Indian government banned the film before it was even broadcast in India, it is doing an enormous amount of good around the world. I think there have been more conversations on gender equality in the last eight weeks than there have certainly over the last decade. And um, I think in terms of the insights that I gleaned on this journey, the highlights for me were what I learned about the rapists, and what I heard from their so-called educated lawyers. It was a complete reversal of expectation for me, meeting with these rapists. I was absolutely convinced that what I was going to be looking at in answer to my question, why do these men do what they do, would be the psychopathy of the rapists. The media had led me to believe that these men were monsters, they were aberrant in nature, they were twisted, they were psychopaths. But they weren't, not one of them. It would have been so much easier if they had been. They were normal, ordinary, unremarkable men who had been programmed by society, by everything they had witnessed and learned since the day they were born, to see women in a particular way. And rather like the Nazi commandant who Gita Sereni interviewed in the book, Into That Darkness, the other reversal of expectation was they felt no remorse, not for one second. And why did they feel no remorse? Because fundamentally, they didn't really believe they had done wrong. So fairly and squarely, that leads us to understand that these men are not just rotten apples in a barrel. The barrel is rotten. It's us. We are responsible for how these men view women. And we are responsible for their actions. And we have to stand up and be counted and accept that. So having come to that realization, about a month ago, it hit me between the eyes exactly what I have to do next. And I started thinking about education and what we teach, and even more fundamentally, what we don't teach the children of the world. You see, the lawyers gave me that clue because the lawyers have had an education. There they are with their LLBs. One of them said if his daughter had behaved the way this rape victim, Jyoti Singh, had behaved, what he meant by that was went out after nine o'clock at night to see Life of Pi with a male friend who was neither her husband nor her brother. He would take her to his farmhouse, he would pour petrol on her in front of the whole family and set her alight. He said that to the Indian media months before I interviewed him, and when I interviewed him and asked him about that comment, 
and thought, oh, well, he's bound to months later retract and soften and backpedal and say, well, when I said petrol, I didn't really mean petrol, I meant... No, not at all. He proudly said, I stand by that remark. Still today, I, would, I believe I would do just that. So for all their education, they are utterly ignorant when it comes to life skills, respect, empathy, understanding of human rights, equal rights. So a month ago, I started a series of meetings at the UN Human Rights Commission, and I am happy to say, as of last week, I am now advising them on a global education program, which we are working on together and developing. We've started, I had a first field trip in Israel at the Feuerstein Institute, absolutely visionary um, educational philosophy. Um, and we are going to inspire and persuade every education minister in the world to co-opt onto the compulsory formal curriculum of our schools across the world equality studies. Gender respect will be one of the things that we will teach. You see, we have only numeracy and literacy for our children. We don't have holistic education. And Aristotle said, <laughs> Aristotle said, give me a child until he is seven and I will show you the man. The early years curriculum in particular, which is what we're starting off with, absolutely crucial. He also said, education of the head without education of the heart is no education at all. If we're successful in this, we will, within 20 years, have educated a whole new generation of equal thinkers. Pray for us. Thank you.